I don't really think about what we do is creating revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, I think about what we do is creating economic opportunity for our membership. And I, but, but as a applause <laughs> from this group. But as a CEO, isn't there, the board expects you to create revenue, no? Those two things, uh, if we're doing our jobs right, mm -hmm. are naturally aligned. The okay. creation of long-term value is aligned with creating value for our membership, for our customers, uh, and that ultimately creates value for the entire ecosystem with which we uh, operate or in which we operate. And it starts, you know, we're a very purpose-driven organization. Our vision is to create economic opportunity for every professional, where professional, very broadly defined, is someone that earns a living from their skill. Mm -hmm. There's 3.3 billion people in the global workforce, and we can't think of anything more profoundly or sustainable, sustainably valuable than creating economic opportunity for people, and not only improving the quality of their lives as individuals, but the quality of their families' lives, and perhaps even more importantly, the quality of the lives that these people can in turn create economic opportunity for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it, we're going to create revenue if we right. do that right. well. Right. Uh, we're going to create long-term shareholder value as a public company if we do that well. So this notion of creating economic opportunity for people, this notion of creating opportunity and doing things for others, I think is very much aligned mm -hmm. with the concept of managing compassionately. So at, at a very high level, in terms of our vision, our purpose, I think there's alignment. Then, in terms of the day-to-day, -day, you have to reinforce it. It's not enough to just state yeah. it as a vision. Right. Frankly, it's not enough to even have it as your value proposition. Um, for us, it's practiced through our culture and through our values. Mm -hmm. and, and we take our culture and values very seriously, so much so, uh, we've codified them. They were part of the filing when we went public. You, you talk a lot about managing compassion, for you just referenced in your answer. So what does that mean, and how does it translate in your daily routine? I just fail to, to see how that looks on a daily basis. Yeah, uh, so managing compassionately is about putting yourself in another person's shoes and seeing the world through their lens or perspective. Classically defined, that's for the purpose of alleviating their suffering. Uh, within a business context, I believe it doesn't have to be limited to alleviating suffering. It can be helping them, helping the team, helping the organization. And you know, day in and day out, whenever any of us are dealing with other people, there are going to be times where you're disagreeing. There's going to be conflict. As a matter of fact, you probably had some conflicts today that you could think of. And if you were to go to any company anywhere in the valley or anywhere in the world for that matter, and you said, how many of you have had some degree of conflict throughout this working day, uh, you'd have a fair number of hands go up. And what typically happens when people experience this conflict is one party, one person, is going to start to escalate emotionally. They're going to get angry. They're going to get defensive. They're going to go on the attack. And more often than not, uh, the person on the receiving end of that may have uh, an empathetic response, which is to feel the anger that the other person's feeling and become angry themselves. It's important, by the way, to distinguish between empathy and compassion. It's really important if you aspire to managing compassionately. A lot of people, particularly in Western society, including myself, you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, would use empathy and compassion synonymously. Empathy is feeling what another person is feeling. A fundamental building block to compassion. Compassion is maintaining enough distance where you can actually do something about the way the other person feels. If you are strictly having an empathetic response, uh, to put it in the parlance of the Dalai Lama, if you were walking along a trail in the mountains and you came across a person who was being crushed by a boulder on their chest and they were suffocating, the empathetic response would be for you to suffocate as well. And if you're suffocating, you're no longer in a position where you can help them. The compassionate response is to reflect on the fact that, not for too long if they're suffocating, but to understand that this person is suffering and to do whatever you can to alleviate that suffering, get the boulder off their chest. So what does that mean? How do you, what does that translate to in a work environment? So you're sitting there, you're in a meeting, and there's a disagreement. They get angry. You would normally get angry. You would normally get defensive if they're getting defensive. And this goes back and forth, and it becomes very challenging to resolve. But what if, rather than just blindly mirror their emotion, or in other cases, oftentimes, people just assume nefarious intention? Well, how, how dare this person disagree with me or attack my belief, my recommendation? 
they must be political, territorial. Uh, they must be ignorant, as opposed to the compassionate response. Being a spectator to your own thoughts and especially your emotions, so taking a step outside of yourself and understanding what's going on. Maybe that person is having a bad day and it's got nothing to do with you or anything you said. Maybe you pushed a button in that person where they had something traumatic happen to them five years prior, uh, unbeknownst to you. Maybe you're talking about a subject that the person is less familiar with and they're feeling a little bit vulnerable, a little bit insecure about looking bad in front of their peers. I could go on and on with all the potential reasons that this person may be acting the way that they are. And the more you can take the time to understand that, the more you can connect with the person and constructively begin to understand where they're coming from and work towards compromise or at the very least work towards shared understanding. That's managing compassionately. And more often than not, especially younger, less experienced executives like myself was, you know, 10, 12 years ago. We have a tendency to expect everyone around us to do things the way we do them. That is natural. It's egocentric, not egomaniacal. Okay, it's egocentric, and that's human nature. But you're not going to get the best out of the people you're working with if you're constantly holding them up against a lens or a bar of what you yourself are capable of and precisely how you do things. What makes far more sense, where you're going to get much more value out of those individuals in the team, is when you understand their strengths, their unique strengths. You play to their strengths where you understand areas for improvement and you coach them on those areas for improvement or you change their role such that it's better aligned with their strengths. And when you can do that, when you can begin to do that, you start to unlock value that's not possible when you're only thinking about the world through your own lens. And so managing compassionately has been something I've been aspiring to do now uh, since first realizing this. And like I said, it's probably coming up on 12 plus years at this point. I say aspiring because it's really, really hard to do. Because we're all human and we all have buttons that get pushed. So for anyone out there that decides they do want to practice more compassion at work, recognize you're not always going to be able to do it and that's okay. The aspirational component of that's really important. Uh, but we evaluate our team. Uh, we evaluate the performance of our managers, of every individual at the company, uh, in part by virtue of the way they lead. And the way we define leadership is not only the ability to inspire others to achieve shared objectives, uh, but the extent to which they walk the walk on our culture and values. Mm -hmm. And two elements of our values that are, are very germane to this are, one, relationships matter. And whenever we say it, we say, in other words, managing compassionately. And the other is being open, honest, and constructive. Mm -hmm. You can be open and honest and not constructive. And right. a big part of that is, again, practicing compassion. And we walk that walk. It's not enough mm -hmm. to just say those are our values or yeah. put them up on posters around the office right. or create those little <laughs> laminated cards or the mouse pads. And no offense to any company that does that. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it, it's not about talking the talk. It's about walking the walk. And had you asked me about culture and values and their importance to an organization yeah. six, seven years ago, I would have rolled my eyes. Yeah. It was the same thing you were talking about earlier, which is why people don't typically talk about compassion. It's like, whatever, let's right. just get back to work. Yeah, yeah, let's yeah. just make the next sale, right. Right? right? And culture and values, at least speaking for LinkedIn, have become perhaps our most important competitive advantage. And if it's not yeah. number one, it's certainly getting there. Mm -hmm. And it's what's enabled us to grow at the rate we've been able to grow. We, we now reach uh, you know, over 200 million members on a global basis, members in 200 countries and territories around the world. We're in 26 cities. That kind of expansion would not have been possible without a very clear understanding and sense of who we are as an organization. Yeah. And yeah. practicing that and manifesting that and walking that walk every day. Yeah, yeah. Who does the hiring company like to hire? Um, that is when you are hiring talent, besides technical capability, obviously, um, programmers have to be able to program. But what kind of skills is LinkedIn looking for now, and, and has it changed in the last couple of years? So I would draw a distinction between skills and attributes. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, technical skills, and there's no doubt uh, that's critical in this day and age, given the role of technology in society. So technology vision, even more so than skills, someone who understands the way in which technology will continue to evolve and shape society, 
Uh, that's an important skill. That's a, that's a great, valuable skill to have in this day and age. But it's not enough because you can understand the way in which technology is evolving. But if you don't understand how to manifest that technology to meet an unmet need in the marketplace, it'll make for intellectual property or it'll make for a good symposium talk. It won't create much value beyond that. So meeting unmet needs and a strong product sensibility and how you, you take that technology and create value for a customer base is, is absolutely critical. You could have the best product in the world, and if you don't have a sustainable business model, you know, uh, during the late 90s, especially on the consumer web, there was a lot of talk of losing a dollar per unit, but making it up on volume, yeah. which is not a great right. business model. <laughs> and uh, so you need business acumen. So those are three skills, and I would add two to that. It's like five tool baseball players and superstar baseball players. So uh, I also think in addition to those three, uh, leadership and the ability to inspire others to achieve shared objectives or evangelize what it is that you're trying to accomplish. If you truly have vision, there's going to be a lot of naysayers. There's going to be a lot of skeptics. And so you're going to have to speak with conviction and convince those around you, whether it's investors or employees or whoever, uh, that it's something worth pursuing. And then the last skill uh, is arguably the most important of the five, and that is resourcefulness. And it's just the ability to get stuff done. Because ultimately, you're going to run into obstacles. You're going to hit walls. Every hyper growth company, all of them, every single one of them has run into walls. And the most resourceful people are those that are going to see the wall and then go over it, go around it, or just go right through it. And I also like those that are resourceful because they don't have the other four skills. They're going to hire people that have them. <laughs> so uh, those would be five skills to keep in mind that I think add a lot of value in this day and age. In terms of attributes, you know, first and foremost at LinkedIn, we're looking for cultural fit, uh, mm -hmm. culture and values, which has really emerged as our, our top competitive advantage. And we're looking for people that are going to fit regardless of whether or not, if they don't, if, if they're incredibly talented and have really strong skill base, you oftentimes see in hyper-growth companies that those companies will relax uh, the cultural bar. Mm -hmm. They'll say, well, we'll get there, but we, we can't overlook this talent. We're growing too quickly. We need them. And it's so critical that you have that cultural fit, especially in those early days, because ultimately those people are going to also recruit, and they're going to lead, and they're going to coach. Mm -hmm. And you want them doing that in a way that's consistent with the kind of company you're trying to build. So I think companies that are on the right path are those that will not relax that cultural fit, no matter how talented the person is. And they're going to say, yeah, they're talented, but they're not a cultural fit, so let's move on to the next candidate. So cultural fit's critical. I think learning curve and just raw intelligence and the ability to learn almost instantaneously, given how dynamic the world is right now, you know, a really steep learning curve. Passion and energy and love of what you do has a tendency to inspire those around you, and that can be a force multiplier. Uh, at LinkedIn, compassion and managing compassionately is a core part of who we are. Uh, humor. We like to work with people that don't take themselves too seriously. Uh, changing the world is hard work, so we like to have some laughs along the way. <laughs> so those are some of the things we look for. You know, picking up on that theme of agility and tying it back to the Dean and Vanessa conversation around certainty versus uncertainty, you built an incredible company. You're part of an incredible company now. What, how do you frame up that issue of, of how do people actually function? How do they make decisions? How do they stick to a strategy in uncertainty? Yeah, so I, you know, we bake that into our values and have for some time now. Uh, for at least the last eight years, we've codified our, the, the culture of LinkedIn, the values of our organization. Uh, you know, adapting to a changing environment is easier when you're smaller. When I first uh, took the job at LinkedIn, we were 338 employees. Uh, today, we're just north of 10,000, which is small by comparison to many of the folks in the audience today. And, uh, you know, a couple of things kind of jump out at me in answer to your question. Uh, two of our values. One is to act like an owner. And so it's something that uh, is really important to us that every individual within the organization, regardless of how senior they are, regardless of their functional role, uh, regardless of their title, they feel like it's their company. You know, I've been at companies in the past and people would get frust frustrated with what's going on or the company's not moving fast enough or there's bureaucracy or this is broken or that's not right. And they would traditionally say, why does the company do it this way? Why does the company do it that way? as opposed to saying, here's how we can do it differently. And I think when you ask your employees to take on an ownership mentality, it starts with we, as opposed to you. And that can make a meaningful difference. 
Uh, another uh, thing that is really important to us is encouraging people to take intelligent risks. And uh, LinkedIn was founded by a guy named Reid Hoffman, uh, kind of a classic uh, entrepreneur, an entrepreneur's entrepreneur, and uh, has uh, been a notable angel investor and some of the greatest successes in the Valley in recent history. And so this, the spirit of uh, entrepreneurship was really deeply woven into the fabric of the company from, from go. And that's something we've tried to maintain and perpetuate and continue to manifest regardless of how big we, we are. And this idea of taking intelligent risks is not taking risks for risk's sake. And I know also some companies or some teams or people like to say, let's celebrate the failure. We, <laughs> we don't want to fail. So we're not going to celebrate the failure, but we're not going to be punitive if you failed. We're going to learn from the mistakes that we've made, and we're going to try to do better the next time. And we're not afraid to... Uh, to discuss what happened and what we could do differently. Uh, so those are our two values, and I think for every organization it's different. But I think the most important part of that is to, to bake it deeply into the DNA of the organization. I would also add uh, the, the people that are being recruited into the company, you know, it's not going to be a, a uniform, homogenous bunch in this, especially in this day and age. And for uh, traditional companies, legacy companies who've been around for a long, long time, it's really important to have some rule breakers amongst uh, the, the key influencers, the key decision makers. You can't have everyone towing the party line. I mean, it's going to be very difficult to create innovation. It's going to be very difficult uh, to do the kinds of things that are necessary in today's environment, like cannibalizing your own business. So you need these rule breakers. You need people who are going to get frustrated and impatient and you don't, you don't want too many of those folks in any one team because that has its own set of issues. Uh, but it's important to strike the right balance.